Here in America, we do things big. I just started my prepper pantry today, and as you can see, it's huge. That pile there will last me 30 years. As long as the rats, birds, and flies don't eat it all first. Everybody, this is Praxis, and in this video we're talking about how to create the perfect prepper pantry. And you know what that means, freeze-dried food. We're going to talk exhaustively about freeze-dried food for hours and hours, except we totally aren't. In fact, this is the only box of freeze-dried food that I even own, and I only own this because I had like some coupon and I essentially got it for free. We're not going to talk about freeze-dried food. We're not even going to talk about food in this prepper food video, which might sound a little counterintuitive, but what we're really going to talk about is how to create a system for storing your food. Otherwise, if you don't have a good system, you just end up like that a-hole at the beginning of the video with this big f***ing pile of food and there's like mice eating it and flies eating it and it's all rotting and everything and that's no good for anyone. So we're going to really talk about how to create the pantry space for yourself. Now, it might seem kind of obvious, just like, well, you know, just throw the stuff in some room somewhere. It's like, done, pantry. Uh, yeah, you can do that. But there are some things you can do to uh, make this stuff last longer when it's in that space. And there are things you can do so that uh, it's an easier space to cycle through food because it's really important if you're going to be eating out of your pantry. And I'd highly recommend the idea of cycling through your food. So you're eating the older stuff, putting in new stuff, eating the older stuff, putting in new stuff. That's one of the reasons people do the freeze dried food thing so they can just like put it in there and forget it. But I like to create an active ongoing pantry. Uh, you save a lot of money that way because instead of buying expensive freeze-dried foods, you're just buying regular foods. But if you do that, you have to be cycling through them. So you have to have plans for doing that. So let's talk here today about how to create a pantry like this. This is a pantry that I just finished building. I've just moved from one homestead to another. I took all the lessons from that first homestead. I'm applying them here to the second place. This is bigger, better, and all around more functional than the first place I was at. And the first place I was at was pretty darn good too. So the first thing you see, if you look in this space, is there's a lot of shelving. And that's what I want to talk about first is shelving. Now you can build your own shelving like I did, you can buy shelving. There's the wire rack shelving or plastic rack shelving that you can get. You can get a really nice shelf that's maybe six or seven feet high, maybe four feet wide, maybe 16, 18, 18 inches deep. Uh, that can work really well. It's expensive uh, for a rack like that. It'd be maybe like a hundred bucks, maybe $120 or so, you know, maybe even more now with the prices, the way prices are going up. But it's really easy and cost effective to build your own. Uh, prepper pantry racks and I would highly recommend that you consider doing that. The ones that I have here are very very simple. Uh, there are these vertical supports, one here, one here, you can probably see them better on this side, bang, bang, you can see the, the posts here. And what these are are essentially ladders. They're built like ladders. There's a couple two by threes in the front, a two by four that connects them, some screws in here, screws in from the back. I essentially made these ladders. Now, if I just took these ladders and put some boards across on the top of them, that would be a disaster. I mean, they'd all just start falling over. If you build like this, you got to attach it to the back wall securely. If you live in a place where you have drywall, you need to find the studs and actually drill these into the studs. As I did them here, I'm in a concrete basement and I have concrete uh, screws lagged in top and bottom, I think one in the middle. It's really important if you're going to do something like this, these things have to be rigid and you know, they can't be all flopping over. But if you can create something like this and lay them out in some kind of a space where you can have access to securing them to the wall, it's really easy to just lay some boards in. These are just some one by eight boards, three quarter inch boards that run along the bottom. And you can really create an incredibly large pantry space for not that very much money. I know lumber's gone up and everything, but everything's gone up, including you know prefab wire shelving. And you can get a lot more bang for your buck, a lot more space by building it yourself. And you also get something else as well that, that has nothing to do with the saving of money, but you actually get a better, more functional system for yourself. And that's because you can custom design it to be exactly what you need. Now you buy stuff that's like, you know, just the wire rack kind of shelving and it's generic, you know, it's for, you know, it's good for many things, but if you're going to be putting specific things onto your shelf, and you are, if you're buying food in bulk, you're going to be getting things in specific sizes, you want to design your system of shelving to work for that. I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, this is one of those like uh, file folder boxes. Let's say I wanted just to hold tea. This is what it used to be in this. Uh, let's say I was planning on stacking these in my shelves. Uh, well, if I was just going to have one, I would want shelves that are what? 
tape measure is a handy device to have, I'd want shelves that are 18 inches deep. If the shelf was less than 18 inches deep, these things would be hanging off the shelf. But let's say I want, I, I've got more room. I can do something deeper than 80, 18 inches. Well, if I did a shelf like this, this shelf here is 28 inches deep. This is a 28 inch deep shelf. If I did a shelf like this, I get one of these boxes in, but then it's, this one ends here. Let's say I try to slide another one in. It's not gonna fit on your shelf at that point. It's gonna be hanging off of that space. So if you know that you're gonna do something of this size, you wanna create your shelves so that they're either, you know, uh, the right depth so that they you can fit one or the right depth so you can fit two. But if they're uh, any longer than that, you kind of have a lot of wasted space. I designed these shelves for these tubs. These tubs are, it says right on the front, 26 and an eighth inches deep and I designed the shelves to be 28 inches deep so I have a little bit of extra uh, room on there. These things can slide on and off. Uh, sometimes I'll take them off and put them on the floor but usually I just get lazy and I kind of do this thing and I kind of rifle through that way. One of these days it's going to fall on top of me but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so I designed this shelf to be perfect for this size. On the other side, over here, this is a 28 inch shelf. This is half the depth, this is a 14 inch shelf. Now, why did I decide on 14 inches? Well, a lot of boxes with food come in are 14 inches deep. This is pasta sauce in here. And as you can see, it fits perfectly right on the shelf. Other things like uh, these juice containers, same thing, 14 inch deep box. All these other boxes on here, they all have a 14 inch depth, as do these tubs that I use for uh, general food storage. Uh, this one here has pinto beans in it, and these are 14 inches deep. So by creating uh, these shelves based on the size of what's going to go in there, I maximize what I can put on the shelf, and I also maximize the aisle area here. Because if I were to have made the shelf an extra three inches here, it wouldn't do me any good for things like this, you know, I, unless I'm going to like stack a bunch of stuff in front of it, and then that'd be kind of inconvenient anyway. But if I just had arbitrarily made the shelf another three inches, I'd, I'd lose aisle space, but I wouldn't gain anything on the shelf itself. Same thing over here. If I'd made this one a little bit wider, it wouldn't really give me anything because I don't want to be taking things and stacking them up in, in, in front of my boxes here because then every time I want to get to this bin, I got to move that stuff out of the way. So it really pays to decide what you are actually going to be putting on these shelves and then decide uh, design the shelf around that. And I would really recommend the 28 and 14 inch depth because of what I mentioned about the size of packaging. And if you have uh, double packages and you wanted to put two of these back to back on a 28 inch uh, deep shelf, you'd be able to do that. So. Uh, doing things in 14 inch increments I think makes a lot of sense and I, I don't think you'd want to do it more than three deep because then it's like I, I don't know how long your arms are but I don't think I could reach back uh, you know three of these boxes so it, it's really important to uh, you know get a sense of what you're going to be putting on your shelves first for me like I said doing things in 14 inch increments made sense because of what I was getting but you decide what works for you look at some of the boxes that you're going to be getting and design things around that and that is for the the depth and also for the height of your shelves. Uh, as you can see with this one, this shelf is here to there, and it just fits this bin. If I had had this thing too short, obviously that would be a big problem. I couldn't put the thing on at all. If I'd made it too tall, yeah, sure, I could still put this thing on and off, but then I'd lose shelving space here, and I'd lose shelving space above, and it would kind of go to waste. Having that space, it, it wouldn't be able to be utilized in any way. So you really want to design also the height of your shelves so that they, they fit what you're planning on putting on there. Also, the distance between your posts. Uh, is is kind of important. Now I know if you're going to be taking these and you're going to be lagging them into studs, you're kind of set on 16 inch centers uh, with the studs, unless you were to put some kind of like a like a, a screw bar up onto your wall and then that would free you up to, to put these things wherever. But I designed the distance between these posts to be such that I could fit exactly two of these bins between the posts. If I had made it a little bit smaller, I couldn't put two bins in. If I made it a little bit wider, then I have that extra wasted space. So it's really important to design the things based on what you plan on putting on your shelves. The next thing I want to talk about is the environment where you're going to be putting these shelves in. Uh, ideally, it'd be good for it to be dry and cool and dark. Those are the three attributes that are going to make your food last the longest. Dry, 
cool and dark. I'm here in a, a burned in environment. Like I mentioned, this is these are concrete walls. There's earth on the other side of that. If you get down into a basement, uh, most places here in the United States, once you get down about four, you know, four or five feet under the ground, the ground gets down to be like in the 60s and 50 degree temperature. That's Fahrenheit. That's a good temperature for storing food at. So it's good if you can put this stuff in kind of a basement environment because it's going to naturally keep kind of cool down there. I've always kept my pantry at 65 degrees or below. This pantry here uh, has had some issues with uh, keeping cool because of uh, you know some of the extra equipment that we have in here. There's some, some pipes that, that get warm and what I've actually had to install is an air conditioner up over there. I've never used air conditioners in the past. It's, I've always just kind of like you know I'll just soldier through it. You know if it's a hot muggy day whatever it's like you know Enjoy the summer while you got it. Uh, so I've never actually owned an air conditioner until it became really important to keep this food cool. Now it, it kind of stinks to use energy when uh, it's in the middle of the summer to keep the food cool, but you're gonna save a lot more money by not having food spoilage. So cool, dark, and dry. The next thing we wanna talk about is uh, the types of tools that you're gonna be using as you set up your pantry because once you get these these racks and everything there are some tools that can help make things uh, you know just flow a lot better for you so let's pop over here so we can talk about some of the tools of the trade how did you like that scene transition? Pretty awesome, huh? Okay, so here is our high-tech area with all of our cutting-edge tools I know they're pretty basic, but they're really important. What we have here is a sheath with a knife uh, and it's just attached right to the structure of our shelving. I'm always using knives to open up packages when I'm, you know, bring things in here. You know, you buy things in bulk, oftentimes they'll come in a, you know, box, there'll be tape and stuff. It helps to have a knife handy and available. If you're the kind of person that always has a pocket knife on you, maybe you don't need that. I don't always carry a pocket knife on me. In fact, I very rarely carry a pocket knife on me. So it's nice to have that here. So I'm not always kind of having to run out and grab a new knife. Dedicated knife just for the pantry. Right next to it, you have a Sharpie. And the Sharpie is super important for labeling things. Now, uh, some labels are for boxes, like this one here. I had a box of something. It doesn't really say on the end of this box what it is. And I wanted to put the boxes in like this. I wrote pickles so I would know what was in there. Uh, and that just makes it a lot more handy so that if I want to put it in a box and it doesn't happen to say what it is on the side, I can just write it on. Because if I hadn't written pickles on there, I, I mean, it's next to ketchup. Maybe I'd be like, well, maybe that's more boxes of ketchup. It's important to know what you have where. Uh, another thing that I do with the, uh, the markers is to put um, dates on all the things. Uh, if you're going to be cycling through your food, which is a really good idea to do, uh, if you're you know not buying exclusively freeze-dried stuff, uh, it's really important to use the older stuff first. Now, we all know that food comes with expiration dates. Now, let's see, uh, let's, here's some peanut butter here. And this has an expiration date on it. And it's, um, now, now this one, this expiration date is nice. It's written in black on top of a bright red uh, lid. So my eye goes right to it. But you know the way it is oftentimes if you're looking for expiration dates, you're like kind of looking on the sides, you're looking on the bottom. It's like, where the hell is this thing? This one, I found it right away. But even finding it right away, there's a lot of text here. It's in that little dot like printing thing and this says uh, 5 of 2022 is when this thing expires what I like to do is just label them not with the expiration date uh, as you can see this one said 5 of 2022 and I've written 6 of 21 I what I write on these is when it was purchased and the reason for that is simply a matter of laziness to be honest uh, like I mentioned sometimes it's hard to find expiration dates like peanut butter was easy enough because there's a big bright red uh, mark on it. I'm looking to look on these crackers here. This writing here was just some notes to myself for measuring some wires while I was working in here. Where's the expiration date on this guy? This is what I'm talking about. Sometimes it takes a little while. Okay, now this one's not even printed. It just, it's stamped and you got to get in just the right light and this says the 24th of January of 2021. Now that is... You know, it, it takes a little while to find that. So what I like to do is instead of finding the expiration dates on these things and then like writing it darker is I just write on them when I purchased the thing. The peanut butter I bought in June of 2021, I think it said, yeah, 2021. Uh, so uh, that's what I write on it. Uh, and the reason for that is that you know the way that it is. If you got a, a really long time consuming uh, task that you need to do and you're busy, you know, you might just say, okay, well, I'll deal with that later. I'll just throw all this stuff in the pantry. I'll sort through it later and I'll find the expiration dates and I'll write them all in Sharpie and I'll organize them and 
I'll do all that stuff later. And then like a couple weeks go by and then you go grocery shopping again and now you get two piles of groceries to do. So in order to avoid that, what I do is I just write the date of, you know, whatever the shopping date was for that. So like every single thing I'm just writing, like at the time of this recording, it is September of 2021. So every single thing that comes into the pantry is 921, 921, 921. I don't have to go searching on every single package to find out when the actual expiration date is. And that's generally going to be fine. You know, most of the time when you buy something from the grocery store, all things being equal, and they aren't always, but you know, all things being equal, the things you bought earlier from the grocery store are going to have a sooner expiration date than the things you bought later from the grocery store. So if you have a bunch of peanut butters, even if you don't know what the exact expiration dates are on the peanut butters, you can just look at the ones that you bought most recently and skip by those and go for the ones that you bought longer ago. And that just makes it a heck of a lot easier than like making this huge chore when you get back from grocery shopping and it's like, ugh. I gotta go and I gotta like look on the, every surface of uh, of all these things and try to find out uh, you know when they are gonna go expired. For me, and I would recommend for you, just write the the date of the shopping trip, and that'll help you to cycle through things well enough. Most of the stuff that you're gonna be putting in your pantry, and again, we're not gonna talk about specific food in this video. There's lots of videos about that. In fact, here's one here that I made recently. Uh, most of the food that you're going to put in your pantry is stuff that's going to last a while. If, if you're putting things in your, in your pantry and you're finding that they are uh, going bad, you know, you're going to kind of, you know, maybe not buy as much of that stuff and really make your prepper pantry be the types of things, ketchup, pickles, mustard, you know, the types of things that don't go, uh, that, that don't go bad because then you don't feel like you have to rush through them quite as much. Other tools that we should be using. Masking tape. Masking tape is handy for labeling things. Uh, you know, a lot of these things like the, well, like this, it, it's very easy to write on a surface like this because it's bright white. You know, you can very easily see what the, you know, what the writing is on there. But some things, well, here is a uh, box of uh, immune boosting uh, vitamins and things of that nature. And vitamins and medicines are also a good thing to keep in your pantry, it's not just for food. Anything that that lasts longer when you keep it cool, it's good to keep in your pantry. A lot of people keep medicines in their medicine chest, up in their hot, humid <laughs> uh, bathroom, and that's kind of like one of the worst place. I I guess the worst place you could keep your medicines would be in your in your car in the summer. <laughs> that would be worse. But uh, you know, keeping them in a hot, humid environment like a bathroom is not a great place to have medicines last a long time keep them in your pantry. And that's what I'm doing here. Uh, when I wanted to label this box, this had a lot of black tape and black marks on it. So I just took some of the uh, masking tape and, you know, put the label on that way. I mean, nothing revolutionary, no rocket science there, but it's, it's a handy little thing to have to just make it easier to kind of scan over your stuff and see what you're looking for. Other stuff that's helpful to have is cardboard. Uh, sheets of cardboard and you know uh, this is an old box from some juice containers this is another one of those those 14 inch deep juice container uh, boxes i like to keep these uh not because i'm necessarily going to get more juices although it makes it really handy when you go to the grocery store if you're not going to like a like a costco or a place that offers big boxes it just makes it a lot easier to like go in with this and then fill this up with juice so the juices aren't like all banging around in your cart they're not all banging around in your car i like to keep these bring them back to the grocery store fill them back up and they're also great once you get in here if you're going to be stacking things like uh you know, like cans or jars. Uh, here I've got all these uh, peanut butter jars. They're in a box, so like they're not like all falling off on top of each other. But here's a good example of, uh, these are some uh, baked beans here. Just cans of baked beans. I wanna go too high with these. If I were just gonna take one stack of these and then try to balance another stack on top of them, that'd be stupid. <laughs> I think we all know that that'd be stupid. But if you take a, a tray of them you can very easily and safely slide it on top and that's a good idea whether you live in an earthquake zone or not it's just nice to make things stable of course if you live in an earthquake zone that's a whole other thing i'm not going to advise you specifically about that but you probably want to have some kind of covering doors or something like that to keep things from falling off because you don't want to go and secure all this stuff and then have it get all get destroyed on you here's some other tools that are helpful to have containers for things like grains if you get bulk grains this is uh an old wine jug I, i'm you know full disclosure i've never drank wine out of one of these things i've always gotten them from uh you know recycle stations you can get uh you can get a lot of great stuff like this and these are a really great way of storing grains because they are 
airtight. The only way the air can possibly go in and out is around this uh, tiny little uh, seal in the top. And uh, they're, they're, they're convenient. You can hang them from the, uh, from the handle here. Um, if you are going to be putting grains into things like this, it's really uh, smart to have a desiccant pack. And you can actually see the desiccant pack right here. Desiccant packs are just a way of making it so that you don't get excess moisture in there. And uh, you can get food grade ones. I'll put a link in the description below if you're interested in that. That's a really great asset for putting things in jars or also putting things into buckets or tubs. That was wheat berries in that uh, glass jug. And here is five gallons worth of wheat berries in here. And there's a desiccant packet in here. This is just a regular food grade a tub this just have feta cheese i got it from a friend that ran, runs a restaurant um once it was empty washed it out cleaned it out dried it out and then you can put grains in it if you don't uh, have a friend that runs a restaurant there are lots of other things you can get uh, i showed one of them earlier this is it is a pet food container this thing here it's called a vittles vault i love these things i've got them stacked all around the whole bottom here uh, on this side i've got them too deep because this is a, the, the, this is the 28 inch shelf over here uh, so i can get two of these 14 inch uh, things in there that's a really great way of doing it because uh, the one in the front is the one that i'm actively scooping out of the one in the back i know is completely filled so once i empty the one in the front i'm not out i'm, I'm not out of pinto beans. I know that there's one that's uh, em uh, completely full in the back. I slide that one forward. I know to put this on my grocery list and then I get this one filled. So having things uh, in double and duplicate is a really great way of making sure that you never run out because you don't want to be uh, going through this and then refilling it until you've used up everything. You want to kind of completely clean it out, uh, you know, get all the dust out and uh, that'll help with things like weevils or, you know, bugs and things like getting eggs in, in your food it doesn't happen very much i've only happened had it happen to me once in my entire life uh where there, there were weevils that had gotten into some rice but you don't want to be mixing things you want to buy it put it in the in the container seal it off and have that stuff stay sealed off from any other stuff you don't want to be adding stuff uh later on because let's say i run this thing down halfway i buy some more from the store i put it on top what if that, that stuff from the store had like some weevil eggs in it suddenly the entire uh, thing is contaminated. So you really want to uh, be uh, segregating them out and uh, kind of cycling through. Completely empty the thing, then uh, rotate to the next one behind. Anyway, these are really great containers. Like I mentioned, they're for pet food. They are FDA approved for food. Now, I'm not going to put a soup in here, especially like a hot soup, and think that it's going to be a great way of storing it. You'd essentially turn it into a plastic stew as it, it saps, you know, molecules out of the plastic and everything like that you know i'm sensitive to that kind of thing but for dry things i feel very confident putting things uh that are dry in these this one like i said pinto beans uh, grains rolled oats rice things of that nature they're going to work out just fine in these things i put a desiccant pack in here and i also always have a scoop and i will show you what i have for scoops when i open these up i try not to breathe in them and have sh skin shedding into them or anything you don't want you to get your hairs in there don't want to introduce anything. Now, uh, these come with this little scoop here, which you can use for, you know, filling up whatever you bring in. Uh, for the larger tubs, what I like to do is buy a big scoop that I can use to, uh, you know, fill things up faster. Another useful asset for your pantry are canning jars. I have a whole shelf full of various containers, but primarily this is a lot of canning jars. And there's a couple different types that you can use. There's the classic types that are made specifically for canning. This one's made by Ball. These have a little ring that holds down a lid. The reason that it's in two different pieces as opposed to like just one lid, like you would normally get something, you know, if you buy it at a store, like, you know, pasta sauce or something like that, uh, is that when you do the canning procedure, you hold the lids down with the rings, but once uh, they've popped in and they're pressurized, you can actually remove the, the rings and you know use them for other things. And some people actually prefer to do that to keep this area from getting gunk and stuff like that in there. So anyway, this is one uh, type and I like these. These are great, I've got lots of these. But another type of canning jar that you can use are, like I mentioned, just the kinds that you buy from the grocery store. This one here had some kind of marinara sauce in it, just a regular glass jar with a regular lid here now there's a couple differences between the two of these uh these you got to pay for you got to buy them specifically for this purpose these i guess you're paying for them anyway when you're buying you know whatever product you're, you're getting but essentially this is kind of a free waste 
uh, material. And if you can use your waste material, it's always going to you know save you resources, save you money. Now the difference in terms of using these uh, and these guys uh, is. Uh, these are a little bit easier to use. The, they are gonna be more forgiving in the process, but given that these are free, it, you know, it's worth your while to try to you know, get decent at using these as well. Now, some people will warn you, definitely don't reuse these. You know, they're a single use. After you use them, you should just you know, throw them out, recycle them, and don't reuse them. Uh, here in the United States, a lot of people are of, of that opinion, but there are many countries in the world, I believe Australia is one of them, where it's fairly common for people to use these types of jars for canning. So. If you are buying food now and a lot of it is coming in these types of containers, it might make sense to clean these off, wash them off, and store them in case you ever need them. Uh, if you ever start growing a garden, you have a surplus of food, this is a great way of storing it. Some things are easier to can than others. I'm not going to get into specifics of what you know foods are easy to can. Uh, generally, things that are more acidic are easier, things that are less acidic. Uh, you know, tend to be a little bit more, uh, you know, you need to know more about what you're doing, but uh, things like uh, tomatoes, you know, they, they can pretty darn easily. Uh, the only difference in terms of the life between these and these guys are the regular canning jars. You need to, uh, well, with, with the regular canning jars, you can be kind of uh, cavalier about what you're putting into them. You can put stuff in scalding hot, even if the jars are kind of cold and the jars aren't gonna shatter. If you put scalding hot stuff into a cold regular jar, there's a good chance that your glass is going to shatter. Now that said, I'm usually pretty careful about uh, putting in hot material into these guys. I like to pre-warm the glass. I pre-warm the glass so that you're not shocking the glass and cracking it. You definitely have to do it with these things. Uh, I think it's a good idea to do it with these uh, you know, regular canning jars just because it's going to extend their life. Uh, the big difference that you're going to notice if you get into this is the lids. The lids for these, uh, you know... <laughs> The canning uh, places say uh, the lids are single use. Uh, you know, if they have a financial reason to say that, because you, you know, then you have to buy a lot of lids. I have uh, I have been using uh, these kind of lids over and over again. This one's been used twice. I've got two different dates on it. I've I've used uh, many of them, you know, five times, six times at this point, and. Uh, I've, I've never lost a lid uh, because the gasket started pulling off on those. Eventually, you know, I'm sure that they will, but you can certainly use them more than once. Uh, with these uh, kind of, uh, you know, throwaway kind of uh, lids, they, uh, they don't have as much life as the ones that are made for the real canning jars. But that said, uh, most of these things I've been able to use two or three times before the gasket started separating out. But that is one, uh, one drawback. So if you're going to uh, stack a certain number of glass jars, I would suggest once you kind of fill up your pantry with those and you're like, okay, I, I, don't, I don't need any more jars. I don't get any more space for jars. You know what? The next time you have one, just save the lids because the glass is going to last longer than the lids. So I've uh, just got a container that's just full of lids so that, you know, once these lids die, I have new ones that I can use to replace it. There are some other tools that are really helpful uh, for going through all of your pantry and making th everything run smoothly. Let's talk about some of those. The last thing that I want to mention is a really great idea to have in your pantry if you have a pantry that's tall like this is to have a stool. Now this pantry is really rugged. I can actually climb right up this and I'll be honest that's what I do most of the time. Uh, but it's really great to have a nice stable stepping stool so you can go up and you can grab things in a safe way especially if you have to put up like a whole uh, you know rack of things or a big box or something like that. It's a good idea to have that. Um, not just for safety now, but if you were ever actually depending on your pantry and there's some kind of an emergency situation, the last thing you want to do is, you know, break a bone or fall or something like that. So it's important to have that extra level of safety for times when it would not necessarily be particularly convenient to have to do a hospital run. And that just about does it. I hope you found this video helpful and informative, but more than anything, I hope that it inspires you to get going and trying some of this stuff yourself. The more people that we can get encouraged to begin emergency preparedness uh, preparations in their own lives, really, it's not just good for them, it's not just good for you, it's also good for all of us. It's good for all of society because the fewer people that are in a situation where they are not prepared for an emergency, the less people are requiring things like government services and emergency services. And the more that we can uh, focus those types of services towards people that genuinely need it and not require those services ourselves, the more it kind of helps all of society. I know that preppers and you know people into preparedness are you know oftentimes demonized. Whenever there's an emergency, people are looking at those those greedy preppers who have, you know, they were hoarding all their food and you know, whatever. But really, 
those people have really helped everybody else out because they, at that point, are not part of that needy problem. They are fine. They're doing okay. All those emergency services can go to all the people that really need them. So the more we can spread this knowledge out to more and more people, it's good for the, the, those people directly, but it's also really good for all of us. And that's why I did this video in relation to the 30 Days of Preparedness. It's a series that's running on YouTube right now. Uh, today was my contribution. Tomorrow, the next uh, episode is going to be made by Iridium242. And their episode is actually uh, really applicable to what we've been talking about here. We've been talking about how to design and set up and prepare a pantry. Their episode is about how to fill it up and especially how to fill it up on a budget so that you can do it and you can save a lot of money. Because that's one of the things that is great about creating a pantry is if you know how to do it right, not only are you preparing for an emergency, but you're also going to be saving a lot of money generally overall. So it's a great activity, whether there's an emergency or whether there isn't. So I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you're finding this series helpful. If you want to see the other contributors that are going to be uh, contributing throughout the month, the schedule is down below in the description uh, so you can uh, you know, see you know, which different uh, YouTube channels are participating in this. I'd highly recommend that you uh, join and uh, you know, follow along with all this because again, not only is it good for you to get into emergency preparedness, it's good for all of us. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode is brought to you in part by Burning Hearth Homestead, a nonprofit that aims to provide seeds, live plants, and education to the community, both local and extended. Plant seeds, plant knowledge, plant the future. If you'd like to thank them for supporting this channel or find out more about what they do, go to burninghearthhomestead.org. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.